Hi everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Yaroslav and I'm a staff data engineer at Tribify Data Platform, primarily focused on stream processing. Today, I wanna to tell you a story about 150 plus task managers, 13 terabytes of state, and a streaming drawing of nine Kafka topics. But before I can tell you a story, let me introduce Shopify. Tripify creates the best commerce tools for anyone, anywhere, to start a growing business. We have uh, more than 1.7 million of merchants in 175 countries. And as a Shopify merchant, when you log into your Shopify admin, you have access to various analytics. You can see analytics about your sales, orders, page views, etc. Uh, all those different charts and graphs and reports and dashboards. Pretty typical um, SaaS analytics, but it's extremely powerful for Shopify merchants because um, you can see a lot of insights about how your business uh, is doing and things you can improve. And one of the most important models uh, behind all those reports is the sales model. It powers a lot of different dashboards and reports and visualizations. And currently it's implemented using Lambda architecture and a set of custom rollups, which means uh, the, the data that you see can be delayed because some inputs are powered by batch and some uh, by stream. Um, batch is needed in order to correct some of the inconsistencies with data. And as a result, it can take up to five days for correct data to be visible uh, as a merchant. Uh, and also query time can vary a lot, uh, especially for largest customers, largest merchants, it can take a while to load all those all those different graphs and reports. And we had to implement a custom system of rollups in order to speed up some queries. So all of that is definitely very challenging. But if you think about what the sales model is in a nutshell, um, it's a select statement from a sales table uh, with a, uh, a bunch of additional joints. At least that that um, was the sales model at the very beginning. And at the very beginning, in order to get the data, we simply ran a query like this um, on, a, on the operational MySQL database. And it worked for some time, but then of course it stopped scaling because we were conflicting um, with real transactional workloads, operational workloads. So we moved this to the um, replica, which again worked for some time, and then again it stopped. And so finally we implemented this Lambda architecture, which, uh, which allowed us to still run a query like this at the very beginning of the pipeline using a um, SQL replica, but then we would stream all those results, um, apply some transformations and write them to Bigtable, which is used um, as a data store to serve all those uh, analytical queries. Now we couldn't really build a, a streaming solution before because all those data sources were um, simple MySQL tables. So it's so really hard to apply any kind of streaming here. But uh, last year, Shopify launched change, change Data Capture, which drastically changed our lives. And uh, the Change Data Capture was implemented using Debezium and Kafka Connect. So now all those uh, operational MySQL tables are represented as compacted Kafka topics, and you can query them um, uh, using any tool. Um, you can apply any kind of transformation using different uh, streaming frameworks. So it allows us a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of how we design and build our systems. And from the very high level perspective, if you think about um, a pipeline like the sales model, uh, you can imagine like this, you have a lot of uh, operational databases first um, with, the, uh, with the actual data that we need to use. We stream all of that to Kafka using CDC. We apply different streaming transformations and joins and enrichments and anything we need to do. And we also wanna use an all up database like Druid in order to natively support rollups and in order to improve our query times, um, a system like Druid is, is very good at serving those analytical queries. So now you take that very big uh, SQL statement and you try to implement it in a streaming fashion using streaming joins. What you immediately realize you can't simply join everything with everything because 
Most of the streaming frameworks uh, only support EquiJoin, which means um, you need to join different sides of the join that have the same key first, right? So we can't really join a line item uh, and a marketing activity because they just don't have any, any key in common. Uh, so you have to join things uh, sort of in, in different chunks and then combine the results uh, using common keys. So for example, most of the entities have an order ID and the final join we perform is on the order ID. Um, and this, this can work. This adds all the complexity, of course, when you have a lot of different um, tables involved. And this is a simplified version of that big uh, SQL statement that I showed, but you'll, you can already see quite a bit of complexity here. Nevertheless, we wanted to implement something like this and um, uh, let's see how we've done it. Um, some of the requirements that uh, immediately come to mind, you obviously need the streaming joints in order to perform all of that. You need a latency because we didn't want to, um, we didn't want our merchants, our customers to wait for hours and hours. So we need a, a, um, a low latency streaming solution. And we realized we need to support arbitrarily late tracking updates for any side of the join. And this is a big deal. Um, the first time I realized it, I was like this. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big deal uh, because we need to support different features that are currently supported due to the way we implement that, that Lambda architecture. Um, so what do we mean with arbitrary late driving updates? Um, if you stream all those tables using CDC, uh, obviously you rely on that relational uh, structure of tables. And whenever things like order edits or imports or refunds happen, you will see all those updates as they, as they go. And order edits is not something we can leverage much, like from the data perspective, from the analytical perspective. If the system supports edits, and if, the, if they can go uh, anytime back in history, uh, that has to be reflected in reports. The same for imports. If we use event time and our event time uh, happened to be from seven years ago because someone just imported an order from seven years ago, we have to go and update our analytical um, uh, data with that. The same goes for deletions. You can imagine refunds work similarly. We don't really know when someone can, can refund. Of course, probably you won't be able to refund something from three years ago, but a few weeks, sure, right? And this goes um, for anything here. Session attribution is just something um, that's specific to Shopify, the way it's implemented, but it also means some late writing data. And typically you would implement a join, a streaming join with fixed windows. Uh, like, for example, here we have tumbling windows of one hour. And uh, let's walk through this example. At the very top, we have an order with uh, ID 1 to 3 uh, that we receive at 3.15. And let's say that order was created. And roughly at the same time, at 3.16, we received a sale with the order ID 1 to 3. And because we use event time, and both um, messages happen to be within the same hour, we can easily join and emit the result in this case. Uh, let's say at 4.30, that order was updated and we need to reflect that update in our uh, reporting. How do we join? Like we, we need to now re-emit that uh, join result, but if we don't really have a sale anymore, because sale was not updated at the same time. Sale just happened at 3.16 p.m. And we can't really use a simple um, fixed join, fixed window join uh, primitive here um, because, well, not all of the sides of the join are gonna be available whenever something is updated. So it just doesn't work. So what do we do? Uh, and yeah, this is just an illustration. Um, Typically, when you join something at Flink, you need to provide that window, window assigner, um, that has to well, be something. Um, and as you can also see, you typically join two sites together, right? You have uh, two key selectors. Um, it's really hard to use the same syntax 
for three or more sites. In our in our case, and uh, sometimes we need to join five things together, and it's going to be very very um, clunky uh, if we use this kind of syntax. So what do we do? Uh, we decided to implement a custom non-temporal join, uh, and the secret sauce here is simply a union which allows us to combine as many sites as we want. As long as all those streams have a common uh, key, we can join all those things together using, using a union. Uh, so we union, we key by that common key, and we apply a join function, which is a key function, which contains uh, a lot of state. And the way it works, um, imagine we receive a message in stream A. Uh, that message goes through union, key by, ends up in a join function. In the join function, uh, let's say we want to implement inner join semantics. So we want to we want to see all three messages using the same key uh, before we join and emit the result, emit the output. So in this case, we have current message A. We don't have message B or C in state. And because of the nature of this union, we only process a single message at a time. So we don't have those uh, sides yet, so we persist the message A in state A. I would say the second message we get is message B in stream B, go through all the steps. In the join function, we wanna emit the result. We currently have message B. We can retrieve message A from state, but we don't have message C. So we just save the message B and we continue. Finally, we get the latest message C, go through the, uh, we go to the join function, we have currently message C, and we can get access to message A and message B in state. And at that moment, we can perform the join, we can um, do whatever we need in that join, uh, can create that uh, output, and finally emit it, and persist uh, C as well. And whenever we receive any, any kind of update, we have access to all sides of the join, even if it happened um, maybe a month ago, uh, three, a month after we received that first message. We still have everything, everything is in state at this moment. And the interesting bit, um, interesting implementation detail here is how you deal with late writing data. Because imagine the scenario where we receive a message for stream A at 1.15 p.m. Uh, with ID 123, and then we receive a message um, with event time 1.13 p.m., right, the same message ID. And in this case, we always want to pers uh, persist and emit the latest version of that entity. And in this particular case, that means we want to first ignore the second message, uh, not re-emit the result because we already emitted the result with 115 and avoid storing it in state. So that's just like one additional implementation detail that you need to think if you support updates um, in, this, in this system. How we implement it? Uh, well, from the high level perspective, um, Exactly like uh, I showed in this slide, the previous slide, we, we apply Plank Union, key by, and a, and a process um, with the join function. And this works as long as all those sites have the same key uh, to join. So now let's look at this uh, join function. Um, as you can see, it's a key process function in the end, and it has uh, a few value state variables. Uh, there's only one right now, uh, this value state of sale record, which is called latest state sale. And we also have the same for saline costs and the same for retail records. So we have three value states here. In our process element uh, method, we receive uh, an input case class, which is a wrapper really. And uh, that message can be one of these three actual master. So we can either receive a message about the current sale or current sale in cost or current retail sale attribution. So that's kind of how we, um, how we um, wrap those multiple um, streams together. And now we need to get the actual 
sale, the actual sale, just in the actual retail message uh, using this get and update record method. So this, this additional helper method just allows us to always deal with the latest version of that entity um, based on the key. Um, and I'll show you how. But imagine that, and, and every single variable here is actually an option. Uh, and uh, in this case, we actually implement a left join semantics. So we want to, oops, I'm sorry. Um, so we want to um, wait until the, the sale uh, comes. And then if it's not now, we emit the results. So in this case, it's actually a left join semantics but you can easily implement an inner join if you just check if all three variables are defined. And the get, get an update uh, record method, um, it's implemented um, in a way that allows us to always compare uh, timestamps. So look at this extract timestamp method first. We assume that every case class that we're dealing with is uh, updatable, so it implements this updatable trait, and it has an updated add timestamp. And this is true for most of the CDC streams that we have. All of them have this updated add timestamp. And if it's missing, we just use zero. And so this is essentially a way for us to implement a uh, last right wins strategy, but with event time. Uh, because we always use this in, in order to uh, extract the actual event time as well. So uh, if you look at the actual get and update record implementation, uh, as you can see, we get the value from state, we get the current record, both of them can be null. Uh, so in this case, we just return none, but otherwise we always call max by uh, using the updated at timestamp. If what we receive is different from state, we update the state, and we emit, uh, emit the result in the end. So what we implemented is a custom non-temporal join. We have a union operator to combine multiple streams. And as long as they have the same ID to keep by, this, this works. We have a key process function to store state for all sides of the join. We use a special timestamp field to make sure the latest version is always emitted. And if we want to, we can also use timers or state detail config to garbage collect some of that state. But I have a question for you. What if we keep the state indefinitely? Like, is that crazy? Um, is stateful Flink pipeline that different from a data store like Kafka or even database like MySQL? Like, if you think about this, uh, they're not that different in my opinion. So we can look at different, uh, different dimensions here. Think about scalability. Uh, with, with stateful link application, you can scale your state vertically by increasing the size of the disk and horizontally by adding more task managers and task manager slots. Um, if you use RugsDB uh, back, backend, state backend, and your keys are relatively well distributed, you can keep scaling, uh, not indefinitely, but for a very long time. Uh, fault tolerance is also something that's handled. Uh, we have checkpoints, we have safe points, we can always recover from a failure. Um, this is all very well tested. So fault tolerance is also here. Like it's not that um, different from a typical data store. And uh, Flink also has some APIs for dealing with state, specifically the, the state processor API, which allows you to do quite a bit of stuff with state. You can use it to recover. You can, you can update the, the snapshot, the save point, and use a new one. So in my opinion, maintaining a stateful system like Kafka or MySQL is actually not that different from maintaining a stateful uh, system built on, on Flink. So maybe we can use the store, uh, use all of this state. And the experiment that we wanted to do, we wanted to implement that sales model topology using the union and a joint function approach. And we wanted to ingest all historical Shopify data, which is tens of billions of uh, messages um, in those CDC compacted Kafka topics. We wanted to store all of them. So no stage GC, no timers, no TTLs, nothing. But just, but just store everything and see how it goes. And our strategy was, we would do that, we find a bottleneck, 
we fix it, and we try again. And the setup that we had, uh, so this was done at the beginning of the year. Uh, we had 156 task managers, four CPU cores, four task slots, 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, the maximum parallelism for uh, the largest operator, the final order join was 624. Uh, it was running in Kubernetes, uh, in JKE, using Flink 1.12, obviously using Rogue's DB state backend, and GCS for checkpoint and safe point uh, locations. And you can uh, you can see the version of this pipeline with even more uh, joints that I originally showed you. Uh, but you can kind of notice all those intermediate joins uh, here. Um, and the final join at the uh, bottom left, where we um, um, combine everything together in the end. So this is this is the, the DAG from the Flink, uh, Flink web UI. Now, the first problem we noticed, we started this pipeline, things, it seems to work, everything's checking along, uh, everything's... Uh, you know, going through uh, at a very good rate. And then after about an hour, things just stall, stall significantly. Uh, this is not even the worst um, a screenshot. Um, a few times or sometimes it would almost go to zero like that, that uh, processing rate. And so we try to understand what's going on and we had to enable those uh, additional, uh, what's called native RugsDB metrics. And we noticed that when things go down, um, at the same time, we seem to fill uh, RugsDB block cache. And so this block cache is used for reads, essentially. Uh, whenever you want to read something, um, before going to disk, RugsDB will use this, this cache. And we noticed, yeah, when the cache is full, um, things will significantly degrade. And we realized, uh, well, we used vanilla JKE setup with uh, HDDs, um, and so the disks were just very slow. And the solution to that was to switch to GCP local SSDs, which is probably the, the fastest uh, disk you can get in GCP in terms of disk IO. Uh, it's unreliable, it's unpersistent, like anytime VM goes down, this will be lost. But thanks to Flink checkpointing, um, didn't really matter, at least for this experiment, we were fine with that. And also, we've done some tuning, as you can see, the flash SSD optimized for defined options, probably the most important one, but we also tweaked, um, uh, you know, we increased number of threads for checkpointing because you're sending a lot of data around and you kind of want to use all the, all the CPUs uh, that you have. So we fixed the first issue, um, thanks Things recovered nicely. Uh, while doing all this investigation, we've done some profiling, and we noticed uh, cryo is used all over the place. Like more than fifty-two percent of CPU, specifically at this um, at this profiling session, we noticed it was spent on different cryo serialization, deserialization, and that's a lot. And we learned that even though we wanted to use case class serialization. Um, um, Flink would fall back to cryo because of some specific types that we used in those case classes. And I know case classes are probably not the, the fastest uh, protocol to use. You're better using uh, rows or tuples, but case classes, um, it was pretty good in terms of performance and also very developer friendly. And so what helped us is the disable generic types uh, instruction to Flink. Um, I know it says that it's not production recommended because you can always have new types and it's really hard to understand that, but it's at least something that you should uh, periodically en uh, enable or well, disable in this case when you launch new major feature because you want to make sure there is no cry of fallback because this can affect your performance quite a bit. And in our case, um, we found those types that are not supported, we fixed them, um, and we keep keep uh, this one um, disabled. And so after doing all of that, there is literally, literally no cryo in the stack trace, and we bumped our performance by about 20%. We increased throughput by 20% just by ditching that um, cryo fallback. So results. 
Um, it took quite a bit of time to backfill, uh, but we were big filling year, years and years of data. Um, and the time to backfill actually depends on the Kafka setup a lot. Number of partitions, locality, you probably want to run that backfill job in the same region as Kafka uh, and have sufficient number of partitions to, to go fast. Uh, once we finished, the save point size was about 13 terabytes. And the most important uh, part here is that during backfill or after the backfill, we did not see any performance degradation in terms of throughput, in terms of latency, like everything was normal. We would just keep writing and reading data to our local SSDs and uh, sending checkpoints uh, to GCS, but we didn't see any performance degradation. We fixed some bugs because we were um, in a position to leverage our internal um, data integrity tool, and we compared, compared the output with the existing system, we fixed some bugs, and in the end, we achieved 100% correctness. So all the results matched between the old and the new system, which is important. And if you can do a test like this, uh, highly recommend it. Um, we tried to experiment with safe point recovery. Uh, and this was interesting. Uh, we typically, uh, it, it would typically take uh, like 30 minutes um, to take a safe point. And we tried different ways to recover, changing parallelism, different things. But in all of those scenarios, uh, we usually take, uh, we usually would take like 30 minutes or less in order to recover from the safe point. And I can, I can imagine a few questions that you have, like um, maybe you can just use global window instead, uh, right? Because that implementation of a join function looks a bit complicated, there's lots of state around, and global window has similar semantics. Uh, it's true, but it gives you less control over state. So uh, with the approach that we show, uh, you can use timers or TDL if you want to, uh, but with global window, there's just that global window that you can't really uh, change much. And we also tried to use global window before uh, using a previous version of the sales model uh, using a different prototype with Apache Beam. And yeah, just had some, some bad experience, so we decided to not uh, do it again. You can also ask, why don't you keep the state somewhere else and maybe just perform some lookups when you need to join? And uh, I think this can work um, depending on the state size. And this is something we've done before with Spark structured streaming and big table. We didn't like it much. Um, it can be much lower for sure. And it can also get very complicated because you probably want to keep that uh, state um, also in, in, a, in memory cache. And now we need to coordinate all those updates between memory cache uh, your external store and yeah it, it, it can be very very tricky to do this properly and we wanted to just use uh, Flink's built-in um, state because it's simple easy to use and uh, it should just work and we proved it, it can work so you can ask you can also ask me will we actually keep all the state around and the answer is Probably not. So this, the, the scaling state or the state size itself, it's not the biggest problem, but the safe point recovery time is unfortunately, uh, we uh, understand that uh, with the increase of the state size, we, we expect to see that safe point recovery time increasing as well. And we ideally wanna be uh, able to recover very quickly um, but unfortunately, if we do double every year, which is actually a pretty reasonable projection for us, uh, that safe point recovery time will increase dramatically. And currently, there is no good solution to just fix that um, in, in, any, in any way. So what we try to do, um, first, we uh, realize that some sources that we're dealing with are apparently mutable. So for example, that sales table, is an event-only sales ledger. So we don't actually have any updates uh, happening. So what we can do in that scenario, we can accumulate all the size of the join in state like I showed you. And then when we emit the result, we realize there are no updates coming. 
So we can just clear that state. Uh, and this is a very powerful tool um, that you can use. And we also started realizing that maybe we'll uh, introduce some trade-offs from the product perspective. So maybe we only support uh, propagating deletes uh, from the last months, right? And this allows us to reuse the amount of state we need to store. And you can find those product trade-offs if you, if you explain uh, how the uh, side of the state affects different different scalability as well as recovery um, uh, concerns. But our dream here is uh, use state with TTL. So maybe garbage collected after a few days. And whenever we receive LA driving records uh, without the state, without all those sides uh, that we need for a join, we can somehow backfill the state quickly only for the current key and remit the join. This sounds tricky. Um, uh, I haven't actually done it. I haven't implemented, but this is something that I really want to do. And I think it should be possible if we do have um, all the data, all the source data still in Kafka. And because we use compacted Kafka topics, it should be possible that if you don't use um, those kinds of topics, maybe something like tiered storage can help. But you kind of need to have all the source data available in order to implement it. Um, that's actually it. I am happy to answer any questions.